Go for it. Groovy. Well, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, g'day to everyone who is online. There's some familiar faces already I can see who uh, on our uh, cruise uh, conference uh, webinar forum we had this morning, which was fantastic and great to have you back. Today's a really, really uh, important uh, presentation for a lot of our, our businesses here right across the top end. And, and today we are really privileged to have the regional director for the UK for Tourism Australia here to talk to us. And, and just a couple of thoughts around, around, around the UK that the UK up until 2019, so if we talk all things before the age of COVID, COVIDity, um, was Australia's fourth largest market. It was number three in terms of spend, uh, it was number three in terms of visitor nights, and it was number two of our, all our international markets for regional dispersal. Uh, the UK has always been a really important market to the Northern Territory, and in particular to the top end. Uh, Darwin, Kakadu, Catherine Betweens have an enormous market share of arrivals. That said, we, we are a little bit below where, where we could be, ideally in our share of all Australian arrivals. Um, and today is, is really to get a bit of a sense about what's going on in the UK. We, we all see through the news um, that uh, the UK is looking for a new prime minister and it was certainly hit um, horribly um, through COVID, but then it has really burst out the other side and we're keen to get a bit of an update as to what's, what's, what's happening and what's life like in the UK. And also what are our competitor destinations doing in the UK? I'm joined today and I might, I'm sorry to say I didn't off the bat, I'm joined today by Jason Yule. Jason is a director of Tourism Top End. He's also the general manager of Darwin City Hotel and Darwin Resort. Um, and uh, I think uh, Jason was really keen to come along today uh, to also get involved. And we're really grateful to have him here. I'd like to thank Shana and also Michelle for putting together today. Importantly, we are coming to you today from Larrakia land. And it is always um, uh, appropriate that we acknowledge the traditional owners of this wonderful land. Um, traditional owners past, present and emerging um, and acknowledge them and the privilege we have to work in tourism uh, alongside the, the great Larrakia people and all people, all First Nations people across the top end. Uh, today's speaker, Sally Cope, turns out has quite the connection to Darwin. And her first year of primary school, would you, you would, you would uh, not believe, was in fact at Larrakia Primary School. Now we've got some images here that we're going to share. <laughs> Sorry, that's not working. Um, and, um, and but also Sally has, has a terrific connection to the top end. And then that was when Wildman um, Wilderness Lodge. Uh, for those of you who are very familiar with that property, that was owned by an organisation called Anthology Travel. I'm correct with that name. And uh, it was operating between 2008 and 2014 with a director of marketing that was Sally. So Sally's joined us at a very early hour in the UK and she's beaming to us live from London for this chat. And at this point, I'd really like to say, Sally, thank you very much for joining with us. I know that you've got a, also got a small presentation um, and we're really grateful for you taking this time and give us a bit of a, a walk through what life's like in the UK, what Tourism Australia is up to in the UK, what other destinations are doing what in the UK, and give us a bit of an insight of, of, of what it's like in the travel scene in the UK. Thank you very much Absolutely. for joining us, Sally. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, as you say, I have uh, put together a presentation, so it's okay. If it's okay, I might just quickly share my screen. It might not be a seamless changeover, but I'll do my best because I'm sharing and then putting it into uh, presentation mode, hopefully. Uh, yep. So that you're up on the screen, we just get that up on the full screen. Uh, hang on, bear with me, bear with me. So do you have my uh, full screen or the notes pages? Yeah, uh, yes, we do. Thanks. Okay, great. Okay, so as you said, I'm just going to give an overview of the market, a few consumer insights about life in the UK, what our trade partners and aviation partners are up to, and just some um, updates on the um, market activity that we're doing um, here in the UK. Uh, 
as you've already said, uh, I wanted to remind everyone that uh, in Tourism Australia terms, we would refer to the UK as a star market. Um, it has always been a solid deliverer for Australia. So at the end of December 2019, uh, just before COVID, it was our fourth largest source market for arrivals. That's around 715,000 people. They spend well, 3.3 billion in total. As you mentioned, number two for dispersal, but also uh, worth noting, but also our largest source market for working holiday makers as well. So very important. I think the stat is actually 25% of UK arrivals are under the age of 30. So it's a big source market for the youth traveler. Um, just a bit of an update of what's in the news. There has been, or oh, what life's like here, there has been a lot of bad news, um, basically around the rising cost of living. So yesterday, in fact, the Bank of England announced another interest rate hike, and I think it's the highest lift they've made in um, something like 27 years. And the reason they're doing that is because inflation is on the rise. It's predicted to reach 13% by the end of the year. So that is causing a lot of angst around general cost of living. Um, one of the biggest things that's concerning people in the UK is the cost of energy, which is also being impacted by the war in Ukraine. Uh, so I think um, in April this year, that they, they have in the UK what's called an energy cap, which is a sort of peak um, a minimum rate that people can, um, or a, a capped minimum rate that people can spend on powering their homes. And that was raised in April and it's being raised again in October this year. So just as the cool weather sets in and people are starting to turn their heating back on, their gas bills are going to go up. So people are very, very worried about that. Um, obviously, lots of um, changes at number 10 with uh, Boris Johnson pretty much being forced to resign and we've got the leadership race and so on. So there's been a lot of negativity and um, angst um, in the media. But it's not a gloomy story. And the reason it's not a gloomy story is um, from our perspective, the UK traveller um, is very, very resilient. And for the duration of the um, COVID pandemic, there have always been places that they can go. So um, whether it's traveling to Europe or flop and drop um, beach holidays in the Indian Ocean, places like Maldives and so on, have been selling pretty consistently throughout the pandemic. And as a result, travelers are used to moving and traveling. Um, and there's this um, phenomenon that we talk about uh, here in the UK, which is just that the annual holiday is almost seen as a right um, and it will be the last thing that people will pull back on spending money on. So recently, uh, Barclay Card in the UK actually did a, um, a survey of just, or not a survey, research on all the uh, leisure spending of people using their credit and debit cards. And they're the biggest cards provider in, in the country. So it's a pretty good segment. And they uh, confirmed that people are pulling back on spending on um, restaurants, pubs, retail and so on as they're starting to tighten their belts, but they're not pulling back on travel. And that's this whole thing that it is prioritised, the annual holiday is prioritised as something people will spend on each year because it comes back to this point, it's like it's a right, you must go on holiday every year. So that gives us confidence. And plus, there's also the other added element that our target market here in the UK is the more affluent older traveller or the youth traveller. And in an economic situation like this, both of those um, target markets can be relatively uh, well less affected 
than um, you know working families in um, in the middle. So we're finding um, that there hasn't been an impact on demand despite all this negativity. And then I did put down the bottom. There's also been a lot of positivity in the press. The Queen's Jubilee was a celebration um, and the all of London where I live is still covered in Union Jacks and there's a real um, buoyancy that came around that uh, long weekend in June. The Women's Euros was just fantastic so that captured the imagination of everyone. England won um, so everyone's really upbeat about that and then last night we had the closing ceremony of the Commonwealth Games which has also been really positive. So there is positivity in the news and buoyancy. It's hot, it's very hot. Uh, we're suffering a, wet, a heat wave but um, I think we just have to keep a very watchful eye on those macroeconomic factors, particularly that could impact demand down the track. But just confirming again, so far, so good, it hasn't impacted the demand for Australia. So I've got a couple of slides that um, illustrate that. Um, at Tourism Australia, we look at uh, search through um, the OTAs. In this particular case, it's Skyscanner. We also look at search through Google. But um, the top graph you're looking at there is the Skyscanner data of search for Australia from the UK, and it's comparing uh, three years. So 2019, which is the navy blue line, uh, 2021, which is the pale blue line, and then you can see the red line, which is 2022. So you can see right now that search for Australia has actually gone over 2019 levels, which is fantastic. And then um, when you look at the forward bookings data, which we get from forward keys, which is the graph below, uh, we're um, almost reaching 2019 levels. So on a week by week basis, we can compare the forward bookings to Australia, which is the bookings made through airline GDS systems. Um, or the dis global distribution systems for airlines. And um, you can see that we're tracking just below uh, 2019 levels. So that's a reason to be optimistic as well, for sure. The other thing that we look at just to measure how we're tracking is a, um, through the purchase funnel. So um, awareness of Australia, consideration, so thinking about um, taking a holiday to Australia and then intention. I think I'm, you know, planning, I'm, I'm, you know, getting ready to book, I'll be going next year sort of thing. And in each case, you can see that our biggest competitor in the UK market is the USA. Uh, they always have, have been, or this data goes back to 2016. So when we look at our competitor set, USA is definitely number one. Uh, it's interesting, during COVID, we made a conscious decision to, I guess, keep the lights on and keep talking about Australia when the borders were closed and did lots of content marketing and had stories in newspapers and magazines and everything. So just keeping the dream of, alive and try, trying to keep Australia top of mind. The Americans were less so, but they've come back with a real bang and they are spending a lot of money in the market now, as is Canada. And um, I think from a, a competitive perspective, this is probably the most competitive environment that we have um, ever operated in because there is a lot of destinations around the world who are throwing their money and investment at the UK because they know it's such a resilient market and it can turn back on very, very quickly. But I think it's, I mean, it's fantastic from our perspective that we're holding that number two position against North, Amer North America. From a trade perspective, uh, we have... Um, Many, many, a very, very competitive um, aviation space. And before COVID, um, it was fab fabulous. I think there was a thousand flights a week um, with one stop that connected the UK to Australia. Um, that's rebuilding. Right now, we're at a bit of a tipping point. We estimate that we've got about 50% of our capacity back. Uh, and by the end of the year, it should be closer to around 75%, but we've still got a way to go. Because the demand is there, and we've had quite a surge of early 
bookings, um, that has given the airlines confidence to rebuild capacity and that is happening gradually. But we're at that tipping point now where the reality is we don't have enough seats compared to the demand um, from this market coming down. And as a result, the airfares are going up. So on average, airfares are up about 18% on what they were prior to COVID. I think this is a pain point and we will get through it as the capacity builds, but um, uh, at, and you know, it's not an exclusive problem to Australia either, but it's just something that we need to be aware of. I, um, prior to COVID, a return economy flight uh, down to Darwin, I think would cost around about 700 pounds. You could potentially get it for a bit below that. Now you're looking at about 1300. So um, it's, you know, it's tough right now. Um, we work really closely with um, both Singapore Airlines and Emirates because they have so much capacity. And of course, Qantas, because even though it may have less actual seats, there's such spectacular brand alignment and obviously the domestic air, um, uh, network throughout the country. So um, they're probably the airlines that we work um, most frequently with in partnerships, but there's so many options, um, all the Middle Eastern carriers um, and, and so on that come down um, to Australia. Our distribution partners are pretty solid throughout the pandemic we had um, two brands that we sadly lost. Uh, Travel2 was merged with gold medal, so became one larger wholesaler. So that wasn't really a loss. It was just the brand was taken out of the market. Um, Oztravel was actually um, um, merged into Hayes and Jarvis. So uh, that was a really sad loss because that was a stalwart of the uh, UK distribution for many, many years for Australia. And sorry, there's a third one, the big one, which was uh, STA travel. STA travel was a big loss because it had really the lion's share of that working holiday maker market in the UK. And so there are several operators now sort of circling and trying to figure out how they're going to fill that gap. Notably, um, one operator who's doing that is Trail Finders, and they are the market leader. So it's great news that they are dipping into that youth market space and giving it a go uh, because they definitely have the reach and infrastructure and everything to take it on. So as I say, Trail Finders is the market leader and they are doing extremely well. Uh, they're a very strong business and they got a lot of kudos throughout um, the start of the COVID pandemic when a lot of these businesses had to repatriate clients, um, you know, refund um, cancellations. And it was the pain that the entire travel industry went through. Uh, one thing Trail Finders did was very quickly refund clients in full um, and there was no hesitation with that and that's what won them uh, great brand loyalty and equity in this market. Other big operators that we work really closely with are Audley Travel who um, are great um, at that sort of mid to upper end uh, really immersive holiday so they you know um, do a lot of uh, multi destination, um, lots, many components in their itineraries. Flight Centre have great distribution up here. They've got Australia in their DNA. So whenever they do a campaign, it's very much with a strong Australia message. And the list goes on. And all of those people on that list have worked with us um, in partnership for reopening Australia, which is great. So we've got a solid group of businesses that we work with. And the bottom three on the list are the ones in, in addition to trail finders who we're working with in the youth sector. Interestingly, it's worth pointing out that at the, the, the company at the bottom, Bunek, which is based in the UK and Newset in Ireland, are also doing um, 
uh, recruitment fairs at the moment. So they're selling working holiday maker packages and trying to um, help people secure jobs before they leave the country. It's a bit of a test case. It's something that they do for North America. Um, and um, it's never traditionally been done for Australia because you don't have to, whereas in North America, you have to have a job before you go. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that pans out. The first one just happened a couple of weeks ago. And then from an industry perspective, I think it's also worth pointing out that we share our office in London with all the state tourism offices. So we work really closely with Fleur and Lucy at Tourism NT who are in our office. We've got a lot of Australian businesses in market as well, who we work really closely with. So we've got, uh, you know, a sense of a team Australia here in market. And there's also um, three major inbound tour operators who have reps here in the UK. So there's a lot of Australian businesses on the ground here and we work really, really closely together because the reality is a Brit will not come to one state for their holiday. I think the official stat is 2.4 states per itinerary. So it goes to that point of dispersal. They move around a lot. So we need to work really closely together. Just to show you a bit of what we've been doing, when the borders reopened, it was a bit of a classic actually. I think I was um, lying in bed early morning listening to BBC Radio 4 and I heard that the Australian borders had opened. So I jumped out immediately, but uh, so there wasn't a lot of notice. Um, within a week we had, um, because we had all of our plans in place, we had um, the big announcement on the Piccadilly lights, which is the big um, billboard in um, London at Piccadilly Circus and a paid media campaign that went digital out of home, online and social, lots of display and um, broadcast TV and, um, and print media as well. We worked with those partners that I listed earlier and we managed to, through that campaign, reach 97% of our um, target audience, our high value traveller, which basically means that we got the word out pretty quickly that Australia was open. So it's that awareness piece. We just wanted people to know that it was open. And open. We did a lot, had a lot of media coverage. It was big news. Uh, and so we um, managed to harness as much as we possibly could. And we also got um, seven journalists down really quickly. So we had people on first flights. I don't know if you re remember, but we had Matt Wright at Darwin Airport. Um, I think the gag was we were rolling out the welcome mat. But um, things like that really captured um, attention um, when we were first opening. We also did a lot of work in the working holiday space. So um, uh, work and play the Aussie way, largely digital campaign. A little bit of an insight here, um, because it's been a long, hot summer, I think people or young people are paying for their visas and, and, and are in the planning process, but they haven't arrived yet. So we know, for example, since the borders reopened to working holiday makers, there's actually been 94,000 um, visas granted which means they've paid for them to people offshore. So that's globally, not just the UK. Um, but I think only about half of those people have actually arrived in the country so far. So we know out of the UK and Ireland, there's just over 12,000 have actually arrived in the country. So they're coming, uh, but they're, I mean, it's sort of hard to leave when it's bright and sunny and lovely and all the music festivals and everything are on here, I think we'll probably see a surge at the end of summer and they'll start moving down around October, November time, which I know is not brilliant timing for when you need the labour force, but at least they're on their way. Um, we also did a lot of earned activity around the working holiday campaign. Um, and it's interesting, it's just finding different ways to talk to this audience. So one of the big partnerships we did was with Sounds Australia, which is the government agency for the music industry. And they uh, sponsored a big festival up here in Brighton um, and brought up a whole bunch of Aussie bands and so on. So we did a big activation with them, both um, down in Brighton at the festival. And then they had the great Aussie barbecue in London where all the bands were playing. Gap360 joined us and was signing up people who were interested in the Working Holiday Maker campaign. So there's lots of different ways, I guess, about um, to approach that audience. 
Um, a really strong partnership we have with the STOs is with the Telegraph newspaper, which has got the largest um, travel website in the country. Um, the most recent, actually, we had a great um, um, uh, double page feature uh, with, you can see the photo with Sab Lord there. It was all Arnhem Land and everything. That was a great story. Um, but we're working constantly year round just to keep this content going through the Telegraph, both print and online and through their supplements. All the STOs contribute to that. And it's really capturing people in that planning stage uh, where they're sort of starting to think about where they're going to go and what they're going to do. And this is bringing out the storytellers and the more in-depth uh, content. So we'll continue to do that next year. We're just assessing the best media outlet to do that. And then we work with um, distribution partners. So it's likely next year we'll have one for running for 12 months with one um, newspaper and a second one running simultaneously for a shorter period of time with another newspaper and give the opportunity to two distribution partners to be the call to action. So that's a really, really effective way of just staying present year round. Um, other things to tell you about, there's been lots and lots of reopening and training and events going on. Um, I was saying earlier, I don't know if everyone um, was online yet, but um, a lot of people who come up from Australia at the moment and arrive in London go, wow, it's like COVID never happened. And the reality is there's actually no COVID restrictions whatsoever. And events are back um, and really... Um, you know, going well. So, um, you know, lots of people attending and so on. We had a massive big welcome back event at Australia House, uh, got the industry and um, all of our stakeholders together. We've been over to um, Northern Europe. So we got all the Scandies down to Amsterdam and, and um, had a big event there. And then the Aussie specialist team and all the trainers from the various different states have been on the road. So they've done both the UK and Northern Europe, um, training travel agents. And this is a big thing, actually, because a lot of travel agents have uh, either left the industry or, um, uh, I guess, got into the habit of selling the short to medium haul holidays. And we've got to reignite the enthusiasm, the interest and the knowledge of selling Australia again. So this is a real focus and it's all being done through the Aussie Specialist Program. Um, Lots going on. You can read it all there. I think ATA was uh, just a great example of the optimism and enthusiasm of we're back in business. We didn't give the operators much notice that it was actually happening live in Sydney. The contingent from this region was large. Um, there was no holding them back. They were determined to come down and see everyone face to face. We've got some events coming up. I'm sure you've heard uh, Marketplace in London, uh, 14 and 15 November. Uh, so that is, uh, registrations are open for that now and we're expecting a strong contingent and that will bring in buyers from the UK and uh, across continental Europe as well. Um, we've got a big new brand campaign that we will be uh, launching in October, which will be um, going back to awareness um, and really just sort of driving that demand for Australia again. We're planning lots of for mills. We're determined to get people down to see the country. So that's key distribution partners, but also media. So the international media hosting program. And um, the other thing that's happening in September is uh, the luxury travel show Pure, um, which is in um, Marrakesh. So we've got a contingent coming up for Australia for that. But I think as we rebuild, it's really important to rebuild those connections and relationships and get face to face. Um, uh, from a, a destination marketing perspective, one of the strong messages we've got um, or competitive messages we've got is that in a way, because there were Australians traveling around Australia throughout the pandemic, and I know that it was restricted it for a lot of it through state border closures and everything, but there was still a domestic market running. We can tell the 
um, buyers up here that the industry is relatively uh, fresh and alive and operating and there has been um, enhancements and you know renovations and things happening um, in the last two years when the international borders were closed and not every destination around the world can say that and that's a really strong message people want to feel confident that um, that you know we're ready for the international visitors to come back um, and from our perspective um, we know that there are I guess teething problems and labour shortages and so on but it's not an exclusively Australia prob problem and so um, I think together uh, the industry understands that the trade sorry up here understands that and it's just about being really open and working um, with people closely and communicating which is why these trade events are so important and then the last thing that I wanted to say is we're also just constantly seeking reasons to talk about Australia. It was madness last week. It was the last episode of Neighbours. So we re-edited our TV um, advertisement and uh, to put a few Neighbours icons and context into it. Um, and the number of people that viewed that, it was in, I think it was about three and a half million on the day and then multiple in catch up. So that was a huge cultural moment that we couldn't ignore. Um, we've got World Pride happening in Sydney in um, 2023. So when London Pride was on, we did a lot of promotion around Australia for that. Um, the women winning the Euros um, here in, um, in London a couple of weeks ago was just perfect timing because it was a year out for the World Cup coming up. Um, all of these things drive um, interest and hopefully visitation. And then down the track, the two traditionally biggest events to drive visitation from the UK to Australia are Rugby Lions Tours and Ashes Tours. And they're both happening in 2025. So it's about how we leverage moments now to talk about it. So the Ashes will be on in the UK next year. So we'll use the opportunity to talk about the Ashes when it's back in Australia and so on. Similarly, last night, as I said, the Commonwealth Games were... Um, uh, the closing ceremony was last night, and so it's about using that to talk about it. the next one's going to be in Australia. So all of these things help to just keep awareness and going and also drive demand. So that's it from me in a nutshell. I don't know if anyone had, I'll stop sharing. And um, if anyone has any questions, they're welcome to <coughs> ask. So awesome presentation, really. Thank you. Thank so you. much information. It was um, thank you. <laughs> uh, quite the insight, quite the journey. And um, I, I love the passion. I love listening to you and talk about what is such an important place. Thank you so much. Um, I think uh, one of the things that uh, you, you mentioned a couple of things in there, and Aussie specialist is one of these things that's been around and, and in the rebuilding of our knowledge base back to trade and, and assuming rightly or wrongly, Sally, and you'll correct me, where there's a lot of new people have come into these positions in product planning, possibly, that are looking for those insights. I think from, from a top-end perspective, our, our first go-to people, of course, Fleur and Lucy, in, in your office, yep. Tourism NT, what advice would you give uh, tourism businesses watching this as to the kind of information that they could be feeding and communicating to Tourism NT so that Fleur and Lucy have that information available to be including in programs like Aussie Specialist and those other content, other programs that you're looking for, top end content. I think um, it's store, people make a place, it's the stories. Um, we really love this concept of using storytellers. Um, authenticity comes with that. So um, when training, so when Lucy goes out um, to do training for travel agents, she's not going to be talking about, you know, what's in a hotel room. Um, she's going to be talking about the experience and um, what you're doing and who you're going to meet and, and so on. So I think um, that brings a destination alive. And the Aussie Specialist Training Program is so 
important at the moment because as I say I feel we've lost a bit of that awareness and skills within the industry so we're going back to basics um, I always use the analogy if you're a travel agent sit, sitting in Darwin and someone comes in and they want to book you know a complex destination a safari in Africa or something they're in your hands you're going to have to go through nitty-gritty how you get from here to there and all that sort of thing that's what the travel agents need to do up here it is a complex destination mm. so um I think uh that's one component and then the other component is just bringing the place alive with stories and using personalities and people to do that and that also works with media as well so it's that um you know, using your characters and your personalities to bring it alive. Yeah, great, great. Jason, you do you have any questions? I do. Super sour. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we we were very lucky to have the direct flights into Darwin, which we lost yep. to Perth, unfortunately. Yeah. So what are the UK travellers' expectations post-COVID? I know that you say they feel like, it's gone. It's it's not happening. We've just gone yep. through another wave over here. So to yeah. build a great experience for the guests coming over, to use an old term that we would both know very well, um, yep. what what should we be doing? What are we looking for? Um, I think um, the it's. The, the UK traveller is quite cavalier, so they're not going to be. Um, uh, expecting to have a lot of uh, COVID restrictions. So it comes back to that point I was saying about real real open transparency about where we're at. Um, so if there are um, COVID restrictions and requirements around maybe wearing masks on transport and so on, I think it's just making sure that the trade is really informed of that, which is, of course, Tourism NT's job when they're talking to agents up here. Mm -hmm. um, people have missed out on a holiday, a proper holiday, um, for a good two years. As I say, they've been doing short breaks to Europe and everything, but this is the year to go big and go large. There's a lot of... Um, expectations and I was speaking to who was I I was speaking to an operator recently and they said that um, they just had to explain um, before people arrived if there was anything different in the operation for example if there had been a um, um, if there was a staff shortage and rooms couldn't be um, serviced every day or whatever. It is about making sure that people are aware and not caught on the hop. It's almost like not hiding from service issues, but explaining why. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, um, I think that is um, very, very important because there's. it's about managing expectations and I don't think we should get caught up in um, it being a competitive challenge because it's a global issue it's yeah. happening to operators here in the uk exactly the same way and, um, so but people are excited they just want to get out and i think people want open spaces uh, they want to reconnect with nature uh, so australia has so much to offer uh, of what people are looking for now and knowing that you have the knowledge of the red center as i do and Darwin, yep. what yep. what's our key selling point for the top end to get the people here? Because the climb's closed, what are we? Yep. What can we do? Yeah, um, we look at the we look at it's interesting. We look at the demand drivers of what people are looking for most in a holiday, and um, number one in the UK market is um, safety and security. I think that's a byproduct of COVID. We don't actually lean into that from a marketing perspective because in a way people know that about Australia because of the way we've managed the whole pandemic. Um, so there is a, a sense that Australia, you know, has a good medical system and it's, you know, a first world country and so on. So that's actually almost leaning into a bit of a competitive advantage for us. Hmm. Next down, it's um, nature and wildlife our unique um, flora and fauna. So um, getting out into nature and reconnecting and seeing animals in the wild is a huge draw card in this market 
um, from the UK. And I know we can often feel like it's um, it's uh, same old, same old, and should we be doing something different? But if that's what people are looking for, that's what people are looking for. That's why when you see Australia brochures on shelves in travel agents in this country, they've always got a kangaroo on the front of them because that is, you know, people are fascinated by that. So um, as a marketing agency, we're really leaning into those Australian brand codes now. And it's um, it's what is so, it, as I said, it's so competitive um, out there. Every destination is trying to get that tourist dollar all at the same time. So it's what is so distinctly Australian, you can't get it anywhere else. And that's the people, um, it's the wildlife, um, it's the indigenous culture. So um, there, our research is showing that um, there is a real growing interest in Aboriginal experiences. Um, and in the top end, that's where, you know, there's some amazing experiences that you can't get anywhere else in the country. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's an exciting proposition, really. Excellent. And package travel, is that still on the market for people or are they sort of... Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's... It's, well, it's FIT travellers, definitely. So people travelling independently. We do work yeah. with a couple of escorted tour operators um, up here, but um, it's predominantly independent travellers. And people will buy, um, you know, an all like a package with their flights and, and all the components um, included in it. One of the things we do when we're training Aussie specialists is really try and teach them how to get as much value into that booking. It's like, how much can you pre-book before you get there? Because from a travel agent's perspective, that makes it so much more worth their while. Because what we're competing against is, you know, you can buy a flight to the Maldives and a week in a luxury resort and you've got that booking done and dusted in five minutes and it's and it's quite a high earner. Whereas an Australian booking's got all the different components. So it takes a lot more effort for a travel agent. So our message is put as much in as you possibly can and, and it ends up that Australia is actually a really high yielding destination and it's worth the effort because you will make good money out of that booking. So we have to sort of talk to it in that frame. Yeah. Uh, and so I've got, I've got, I'm going to just bring it back for a little bit too. Um, we will have people watching this that are very excited about the UK and very enthusiastic for all the information, but they are in a role possibly they haven't engaged with the UK before. So what's the, what's the one, two, three for uh, someone who's thinking about taking their business or they're the director of market, sales and marketing director of, of a business that wants to re-engage with the UK? What would be the one, two, three that you give them right now? Um. Lean into the um, STO. So as I said, you've got the Northern Territory on the ground and they know who the specific NT specialists are and where the biggest opportunities are and they're great for advice. And of course, you're also very welcome to talk to Tourism Australia as well. Um, we, with together with those states, um, um, work to, you know, to get um, people up for the events like the marketplace. Yeah. Um, that is a it's it's a an investment to register it's an investment to get there but if you want to make an impact in the market i think getting there face to face if you can um will certainly do so and coming to a marketplace rather than um going it alone and doing a big road trip is actually a more cost efficient and time efficient way of doing it because we're hoping to get around um i think 90 to 100 buyers in the room so you'll see everyone simultaneously and then of course you've got that in reverse when ATE comes around so it's taking advantage of those platforms that we provide um, if you can um, just to meet people face to face it's still a people industry um, and, and uh, it's about you know relationships staying connected and being really open and transparent about the experience, the delivery of the experience. Um, everyone has been through their version of the COVID pain. Um, and as an industry, we're all rebuilding together. So I think there is empathy on both sides on making, lifting this, restarting everything. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I, um, th 
thank you. I think that's great advice. And I think for those who haven't had the opportunity to meet Fleur or Lucy, they are two, um, I tell you what, you couldn't get two more people living outside the Territory who know more about the Territory and understand the nature of the traveller through, so, um, uh, through, to the, through, to, through to the top end. So um, for everyone watching, I really encourage that. Um, Dom's just put a, a quick message up on the chat and I might just pop that up on the chat there. And that was a, don't forget, I think he put something up. Yeah. There is and the hyperlink, I think, for registrations for Marketplace. He has to put the hyperlink up on there. Thanks, Tom. Good on you for that. And we'll make sure that that is also sent out in the follow-up to this. Um, I think, uh, Sally, I want to say thank you. Thank you so much. You've uh, To be sitting here You're and welcome. having a chat to you live in London, I really appreciate it. And I can give you a bit of news coming in. It's just coming on the NT News here, actually. And that is the Larrakia Primary School has just announced their school reunion. So we look forward to you being back in Darwin very soon. I'll send you the dates through and we look forward to catching up. I was up. a very little girl. <laughs> All the more Aww. reason to come back for that reunion. But um, I tell you what, I would love to come back. <laughs> well, we, we, it would be gorgeous to have you here. So today has been so insightful and it's been such a privilege to spend this time. And we're really grateful for you to getting up early in, in London to be able to spend time and talk to us about what the great work that Tourism Australia has done, supported by the great efforts of Tourism NT, and giving some insights to what life's like and where the opportunities are. Thank you very much. And I also would like to say a big thanks to, to Dominic at Tourism Australia as well for helping, for helping organise this. So thank you very much. Thank you.